Hello, so this is our uh, fifth lecture on, free prob on, uh, on commutative geometry and we'll do some uh, free probability uh, today and probability in general. So it's going to be analysis after all these uh, four lectures of tough algebra. We'll eventually do some analysis and uh, this is actually very good uh, philosophically speaking because that's a big mystery when there are non-commutative geometry and quantum mechanics. It's rather about algebra or rather about probability. And uh, philosophically, I think all this goes back to the, to the Bohr-Einstein debates, right? They were uh, the guys to, to discuss all this. And uh, I think at that time, uh, somehow also mathematics and physics split. Before it used to be the same thing, math and physics. And then somehow, if you look, mathematics is somehow the science, which uh, of course looks at uh, at mechanics, classical and quantum, and uh, quantum mechanics somehow they are they are more uh, they favor this algebra point of view and uh, all this differential geometry, which is uh, which is very very algebraic, and physicists are more into uh, into probability, let's say. So I think there is a kind of fight and debate between geometry and probability going on since that uh, Einstein thing. So. Uh, but we did so far, it was four lectures of, uh, of tough algebra. So uh, I think we sounded like mathematicians so far, and we'll, uh, we'll see today that we're actually physicists. So we'll do a lot of probability. Okay, so this was for the joke. Now let's, uh, let's find this presentation, see what we have to, to say. So non-commutative integration theory, that's gonna be the, the thing to have fun with today. So what's the plan? Uh, we are interested in uh, integrating over the manifolds that we have, right? We have so far uh, a sphere, torus, unitary group, and reflection group. So we'll do this in, uh, in steps. So first, uh, what we know is that UK are easy. That's, that's the main thing, okay? And uh, so uh, we've already seen the Weingarten formula before we're talking about spheres, things like that homogeneous spaces. Now we'll see in detail the Weingarten formula for U and K. We'll talk as well about uh, TNS, via this Weingarten formula. And then, uh, well, the Weingarten formula is very theoretical. I mean, it's, uh, well, it's very concrete, but it's still theoretical. It doesn't tell you what to compute and how to do it. For, uh, for that, you have to do some free probability first. So we'll learn that a bit. And with Weingarten and free probability knowledge, we'll, uh, will be able to integrate in the free case very good and have results when uh, n is big. Then we'll go to more difficult problems, uh, also free integration, when, but when n is fixed, this is more technical. And finally, we'll end with uh, first some magics concerning rotations and permutations. The idea is in the classical case, there's nothing to do between rotations and permutations. And in the free case, they're related by a twist. And that's very interesting, uh, both algebraically and probabilistically. And finally, we'll talk a bit about Laplace and Dirac operators, manual aspects. So let's uh, have it started. Weingarten formula, so uh, uh, this is it. <laughs> Yeah, it's actually very simple, so let's look at the proof first, okay? So we want to compute this kind of integrals uh, over an arbitrary quantum group, not, not easy, just arbitrary. So products of coefficients, and this one is k are some exponents, either one or triple star, right? So this gives you all the integrals. Now the idea is that to group these integrals uh, over uh, fixed values of k and this one is k. Why? Because these integrals all together where, where the indices i and j vary form the projection onto the fixed points of UK. That's the Peter Weiss theory, or even the, the construction of the hard measure by Wallerovich is like this. So we need to compute the projection on that space. Now what's the idea? So we'll take uh, a basis on that space. We assume that we have a basis in that space. Which is the case, for instance, for easiness of so these broad type things, they give you this. But in the abstract setting, we just need a basis. So, as the problem, we have a basis and we need to find a projection on that basis. So, well, you do the linear algebra, it depends on the gram matrix on the basis, and more precisely on the inverse of the gram matrix. So, here is the formula that you get. 
So yeah, so let's have a basis. Uh, the gram, you take the gram matrix of these vectors, you invert, that's the so-called Weingarten matrix. And then uh, such an integral is the sum of uh, entries of the Weingarten matrix uh, weighted by coefficients, which are scalar products of the elements of the basis with the, the basic tensors. I mean, they're the coefficients, if you want. Of the of the basis, so that's just uh, linear algebra. If you want to compute these integrals, they, the only trick is to look at them all together. It's a projection to something spanned by uh, by things, so it depends on the inverse of the gram matrix. Now, in the easy case, we have our basis. It comes from partition, so the formula simplifies. So, as the gram matrix, this is the implementation of the vectors, right? Of these usual Kronecker's. Now, if you take the scalar product of two guys like this, you get uh, this, meaning that it's n to the number of blocks of the joint of pi and sigma. Pi and sigma are partitions, you put them all together, and you get the partition somehow, which, uh, which defines both, and you take the number of blocks of that. That uh, just flows from this. So you invert, you put it like this. And so before here, we used to have the, in the previous slides, the coefficients of the basis. Uh, well, these coefficients are just these chronic error symbols. That's your very hard formula. So extremely good formula. So this is uh, something that you can run on your laptop, okay? You just plug in this, you leave your laptop to compute this uh, during the night, and then you get the integrals you can uh, can write your paper. So this is the most advanced integration formula, I think, in, uh, in the whole mathematics and physics. Uh, I mean, it's not advanced, it's a triviality somehow for Peter Weil, but uh, it's very, very, very efficient. So people like engineers, all that, if they want to integrate over ON or UN, I mean, the classical case, they use exactly the same here. So it's extremely, extremely powerful because it can be run on a computer and uh, explain to, to undergrads, so uh, yeah, very powerful. Now, so with this, uh, we'll go slowly, so in theory, now we know how to integrate over u and k, right? So before getting into that, computing explicit integrals, let's talk a bit about the torus and the sphere too. So for the torus, well, you can do something with easiness, but best is to uh, integral anyway there, it's very simple. So on the group algebra, that's your formula. The integral of group elements is your one, depending on whether g is one or not. So if you want uh, such kind of monomials, we just see if they are one or not. So that's just the basic formula. It's enough, I think, for most applications. You can, of course, go beyond that to say, that in our case, t is the diagonal torus of easy quantum group. So we can uh, do it with partitions too, but for most applications, that's, that's just enough, you know, it's trivial somehow. Now for the sphere, where well, remember the sphere appears as a homogeneous space over the unitary group. So it's the, the coordinates of the sphere are the, is the, um, are the uh, first column coordinates on uh, the unitary group. So just take the Van Gerta formula as to carry it before here. And we assume that all the j's are one, this amount in this. So this chronic error symbol will be one. So we get uh, some like this. Well, we can write it like this. It, it's once again, the sum of uh, entries of the Van Garten matrix parameterized by certain things. More precise, pi must be less than Ki and sigma is free. Why sigma is free? Because uh, Sigma is the partition corresponding to the number two indices, which are the j's, which are all one, because we are for one column. So in short, we have we know how to integrate and uh, get extremely explicitly on STUK. Later on, next time we we'll talk about more manifolds and uh, we'll have more integration formulas. But uh, at the moment, uh, it's, we know how to integrate on everything, right? On all our uh, manifolds. Now, in order to process a bit, uh, well, this is tricky probability you have to know a bit. Say, if you just take that formula and try to compute things, you won't get uh, very far. So uh, it's very, very tricky. So let's uh, let's learn a bit. This is stuff by Boy Voiculescu done in the 80s. 
So I'll talk about free probability in analogy with classical probability. So the results will be a, a, will come in pairs, classical and free. So let's take a to be a C star of for Neumann algebra or even star algebra of the trace. What matter is the trace? No? The algebra doesn't uh, the topology doesn't matter much for the moment. And to algebras, that's something that you know they're independent if uh, this is true. Right, it's basically a kind of tensor product situation. Now they are free, according to wave less wave, kind of the same thing happens, but uh, instead of BC here, you put BC on B2C to an alternating uh, product. I mean, these things are no longer uh, commute, so no longer commute, so that's, uh, that's freeness. Okay, now as uh, all this might seem a bit abstract, as a main example, if you take group algebras, Group algebras are independent in the tensor product. That's what you get here, tensor product. And free inside the free product. What you get here is a free product. And this is very good because with this we have models now for uh, classical, for independence and freeness. So for classical convolution and, uh, and free convolution. So it is normally, in a classical case, you can develop a Fourier transform, and solve everything with that. In the free case, you can develop the so-called R transform of Wojplesko, solve everything uh, with it. Uh, so, as the first couple of results, we have central limit theorem and free analog of this. So, CLT, you know, if you take uh, the variables, center same variance, then the, the sums converge to the, to the normal law. So, here, there are many versions. So, here I'm using uh, Every single parameter t, t is the variance. We'll, we'll need that parameter later. It's important. Now, as the free analog of this, so same thing, but FID meaning free identically distributed, also centers invariance. Same averages converge to the Wigner semicircle law. You get a semicircle instead of your Gaussian. So, semicircle, uh, that's uh, when t is one, just that's just the semicircle on minus. 2, 2, and uh, gamma t integral is rescaled thanks to t semicircle. Very good, and uh, you can see that it's tricky. I mean, Wigner is a physicist from random matrices, and uh, he discovered the semicircle law as the limiting law of, of Gaussian matrices. So, uh, there are many things behind all this. Now, uh, the other couple of important theorems are plus one limit theorem and free plus one limit theorem. So Poisson, you all know, in this kind of guys converge to the Poisson law. And uh, that's the reason, actually. The CLT is the reason why the normal law appears everywhere. If you measure what we're seeing, in the nature it's going to be Gaussian. And if it's discrete, it's going to be Poisson. So these theorems are behind the, the occurrence of uh, the normal law and the Poisson law. Almost everywhere, it's about the same in the free case. So in the free case, you can do the same thing. This box here means free convolution in the sense of Wojculesco. Take up Bernoulli and these convolutions. And you get another law from random matrices, so-called Marchenko pass 2 law, which is something like this. And uh, well, which is also called free Poisson because it appears as a normal of Poisson. So what's the idea here? That's somehow the square of the semicircle. If you take a variable following the semicircle law, the square will follow along like this, and that's marching compass to it. But uh, yeah, written like this, it doesn't look very, very good. But it's also from the matrices. It appears, it was discovered by marching compass to in the maybe 70s from complex Richard matrices. So these limiting laws are very related to random matrices. And uh, finally, one more thing uh, if you have plus one, you also have compound plus one now. So now, let, well, this is, uh, I compacted a bit the slide. So once again, you're taking Bernoulli, uh, not Bernoulli, I replaced the Dirac here by an arbitrary measure. That's a cool point. And uh, these things converge to the so-called compound Poisson law. And this, uh, the free convolution, you get free Poisson laws. Now, uh, what are the main examples of this? Well, the simplest example that you can put here Besides delta one, so delta one gives you Poisson free Poisson. You can take uh, the, the measure on the, on the roots of unity, epsilon s, the parameter t if you want, and you get the so-called Bessel and free Bessel laws. 
So these are exactly one level uh, up uh, with respect to Poisson free Poisson. So see that's the first of you have uh, normal law and Wigner semicircle. There is actually a complex version of that. There are also complex limiting theorems, complex Gaussian and Voipulus to circular law. So these are the continuous things. And now in the discrete, you have Poisson free Poisson, then Bessel free Bessel, and then more general compound Poisson, compound free Poisson. So this is really very nice. It's, uh, it's of course good to know when doing anything probability. Now let's go back to our quantum groups. Let's try to do something with the quantum groups first. So uh, here they are. They form a cube. We already see this cube. And so there are eight of them. I mean, um, we won't um, talk much today about half liberations and hybrids. We just focus on the main cases: real, complex, classical, pre, and unitary reflections. We have eight of them. Here they are. We know that they are easy. These are the categories. So we've seen all that. So if you want to compute, uh, you can apply the Weingarten function with these partitions and uh, do the combinatorics. And when n is big, you get the following laws for the characters and more generally for the truncated characters. So uh, the character is the, the sum of the, on the diagonal uh, for a representation. And uh, you, you can put a parameter t, I mean, truncate. That, that, that's important. And we get exactly these main laws in uh, probability, so you see. So let's uh, go back to the cube. So let's start right face is continuous, left face is discrete. So let's start with continuous. We get exactly the laws I was talking about, Gaussian, Wigner, semicircular appearing from the CLTs, and complex Gaussian, we close to circular from the complex CLTs. And on the left, we have this, um, real and complex Bessel and their free analogs I was talking about. By real Bessel, I mean the measure there appearing uh, raw in the formula is the usual Bernoulli one, at one is minus one. And free complex, uh, by complex, I mean the, the pure complex where you take the uniform measure on the, on the mid circle. So this is very nice and conceptual because the vertical arrows, uh, so I already told you, you have all these limiting theorems, all that in bijection, but there is a bijection which was axiomatized by Berkovich Pata between classical and free measures. Actually, between classical semi-groups of measures and free semi-groups of measures. That's why I did this T for uh, making the things work. So this is very nice. That's work by uh, by me and Benoit Polis in the in the zeros. Very nice diagram. And uh, so very good for quantum groups. <laughs> and uh, it's good for free probability too. I mean, uh, people in free probability, they have all these arrows, but then they don't really have the other ones. I mean, our cube somehow, you see the cube here, has more structure than they're seeing. It can also intersect with seeing that these are uh, generation intersection diagrams. I mean, all these things refine a bit of probability at this level of the basic cube. So uh, somehow, we, uh, we stole the cube from them, it's ours now. <laughs> We're the best at cube, but free probability is of course not about this cube, it's about others in random matrices and applications in top stuff. So uh, this is just or their zero I mean, moment method, it's uh, trivialities for them. But it's still conceptually, I think the cube is, uh, is ours somehow. So this is very good. So I uh, would like to say uh, when seeing this, that yeah, the passage from classical to free, if you choose well your variables, like the instrumented character, is the Berkovich pata bijection. So that is very good news. We should open some champagne now. But actually we shouldn't because for the Torah is not Berkovich pata. So uh, the joy was very short. If you take the Torah, so I remind you in the, um, the unitary and reflection group case, they are the same, the Torah, okay. And uh, now what are the variables? I remind you, for a torus, uh, that's a group dual, and you have on the diagonal G1, G, and the generators, zero elsewhere. So it's the sum of generators that you're looking at, truncated if you want, and parameter T. And this is some classical thing, this area. In the classical case, you get Meissner laws, and in the free case, free Meissner laws. So, uh, and these are not in Berkovich pata bijection. It's uh, if you provide you have Berkovich pat like eighty percent of of the things in bijection are Berkovich pata, but twenty percent left are related to this Meissner free Meissner. So uh, we get this. 
So finally, uh, the liberation of Torah is not exactly Berkovich, but is Meixner, Fib Meixner, and in order to understand somehow how to unify spheres and Torah, uh, well, we're getting into this whole problem and probability. So uh, no one really knows what to what to do with it. But first, it's quite interesting philosophically. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, we're getting here into difficult questions. We'll talk about it later in the next lecture on trying to liberate arbitrary manifolds, because there is no really no if these manifolds are under should, should expect Berkovich Pata or Meixner. No, no. So uh, we're getting into very interesting and open problems. Now, so all this was uh, when n goes to infinity, of course, it's asymptotic, right? Because uh, the Weingarten combinatorics, everything simplifies when n goes to infinity. Um, that's in the philosophy. And, yeah, if you provide your first, the probability to the first do things at n is infinity and big, and then you go to, to higher orders at 20 fixed. Now, we won't really need to go to higher orders and all that because for when n is fixed, let's just focus on the real spheres now and try to do some computations. So, uh, if you want to compute the hyperspherical laws, that is the most interesting thing. Um, well, you must compute these integrals here, you don't really need Weingarten and uh, just need the uh, polar coordinates. Yeah, some calculus you get these double factorials. So that's uh, your integrals over the sphere. So here, uh, as I told you, I mean, a priori you have Weingarten too, but this is just more efficient. So uh, it's an exact formula, no combinatorics. It's even simpler. This can be run. Weingarten can be run on a laptop. This can be run on a, I don't know, simple. Uh, on your watch, maybe if you have an electronic watch, you just need to know how to compute factorials. Now, so this one for the classical sphere, now for the half liberated one, it's about the same time of formula because remember we had these models uh, with the anti-diagonal matrices of uh, Bishop and Violet. So these models uh, commute with a higher integration function also. Find the uh, uniform integration of the half classical sphere it's basically the integration over the complex sphere, but somehow twisted by the, this diagonal matrix thing. So uh, you, you get it from the previous result, you work out what happens in the model, you get this with the uh, plane factorials now, from double factorials. Now, from the free sphere, uh, there's no, so all this was calculus, right? Uh, for the free sphere, you have to use Weingarten and uh, Computations there are very tough. So this is the result that I found in the Collins and Zinjustan, I mean, uh, Paul, Paul Zinjustan, who's a very bad physicist, knows everything. Uh, he did a lot of computation and ended up with this, this thing. So moments with the free hyperspherical law and it is fixed. And this is it. And uh, you have a Q there too, I mean, <laughs> yeah. So what's the idea is that, uh, you take the hyperspherical coordinates. So I remind you the sphere, the free sphere is the first row of coordinates on the pure orthogonal group. So it's better to do it like this. And now the idea is that uh, we have considered this Q, Q plus Q minus one is minus N. Somehow this is a uh, equivalent, like monoidal equivalent, something like this, SU2Q. And now SU2Q, can be modeled, that's an all result by Voronovich in his first uh, paper, like twisted SU2 group. Uh, it has a very interesting model on L2 of N, which models also the higher functional. So we're getting finally into some operator theory problem and uh, well, some calculus, and then you have very advanced calculus. I mean, you know, these five, seven, eight things, it's just terrible. Um, the most terrible things in the hypergeometric series of functions and you get to this very good. So it's now so very nice mathematics here. Now, uh, let's talk about something very interesting now in the end, which doesn't appear at all in the classical case. And uh, I think this is one of the main hopes for uh, applications to physics. So it's uh, something related to quantum rotations and quantum permutations. So all this, we need some, some tough algebra, so let's start with simple things. So uh, 
remember for n plus, let's try to compute the theorem rules for n plus. So I've already told you here in the slide before that this is monoidal equivalence to this, so it's the same as SU2, but there is an explanation for this, which will be useful for what we want to talk now about rotations and permutations. So the claim is that, yeah, the fusion rules are the same as for SU2, and of course the dimensions differ, I mean, Q is, uh, it depends on our Q number. So how to prove this? Uh, well, we have to use easiness. So uh, when plus comes from, uh, from crossing pairings, so uh, particularly let's compute the moments of the main character. These are semicircular. Uh, actually, that's something I already told you about, that's semicircular. And now, for SU2, it's also semicircular. I mean, SU2 is just a sphere in four dimensions. You can see there you are. Uh, your semicircle, so uh, yeah, give the same fusion rules. Now let's do the same thing now for permutations. So let's try to do the same thing with what SM plus here. We get exactly the same form except that we have plus one instead of, let's go back, plus two. So these are the Klebs Gordon rules again, but for SO3 this time, okay? Once again, the dimensions are different. So why is this true? Once again, easiness, now it's all non-closing partitions, and you get this. I mean, it's Marchenko plus two, three plus one, or squared semicircular, there are three names for this law. And uh, this shows that uh, you're in the square situation somehow. It's a bit like SU2 versus SO3. So same fusion rules as for SO3. So, well, this suggests that uh, you see S and plus one and plus are, uh, are very related. And um, well, here's the result, but this is tough algebra. So P one and plus is a cocycle twist of S and square plus for any and that's, uh, that's Bishop did it. A paper with me and Steve Karen. And uh, Paul, you see this, I mean, uh, this has nothing to do with the real case, right? PON has nothing to do with SN plus, so this is really very interesting. And uh, the case N is two somehow corresponds to what we're talking about before here and here. These things are best seen at N is two, because here the dimensions are the same as for SU2. And this is best seen at N is four, because here the dimensions are the same as SO3. So these two previous slides make a connection somehow between O2 plus and S4 plus. This works in fact between ON plus S and S M squared plus for any n. So I can prove this now in relation with the probability. So uh, we have for instance this. So you see this theorem, this follows from the first one. It's a, it's a series of theorems. So we have a co-algebra isomorphism, which is trace preserving, I and mean, trace is a hard measure. So uh, that's the formula. So this means is very interesting. I mean, all these hyperspherical variables here, you just apply to them this, and you get variables here, and then you'll have the same loss. So here is one more uh, theorem now, which is even more precise. The following algebra is not isomorphic. Those generated by the square of the coordinates, those generated by this kind of rectangular sums, coordinates for S and plus. So now this is interesting because these rectangular sums uh, are called uh, follow the hypergeometry laws. So uh, you see, I take a rectangular sum like this, and the law of it is called free hypergeometric. That's exactly in the classical case. That's a hypergeometric law with three parameters like this. You take this, this rectangular sums. And all this twisted business, twisting business we're talking about tell us that this free hypergeometric variable has the same law as the square root of the free hyperspherical variable. I mean, the one uh, computed by Azin Justin and others of us. So this is very interesting. And there are, of course, many other. Uh, my paper with Julia and Steve, uh, we have many other things about this. Uh, Free hypergeometric laws, which are very interesting. I mean, they mix somehow discrete and continuous. I mean, uh, you get some semicircles, some Poissons there. I mean, it's very strange. It doesn't, uh, there's nothing to do with what happens in the classical case. Very nice phenomenon. And this is actually uh, maybe some of some interesting connection with this uh, applied non commutative geometry. I mean, uh, 
if you look at, you know, you have this work of Cham and Corner, right, on a standard model. It's very important. And uh, later, um, uh, Booming and the other groups can also thus look at the uh, free gauge group of this uh, standard model thing. And it's basically the classical one, you just put pluses everywhere, you know, your, uh, your groups there, so you get PON pluses basically. But now you see PON plus is actually a, it's a twist of SN plus and SN square. So uh, what concerns the, the quark part somehow, PON plus equals PON plus. Yeah. That's also one thing. So P3 plus is P3 plus, so it's, it's a twist of S9 plus. So uh, some of the questions that are there are uh, one permutation of nine points in that quark part of the standard model. This might be related to all this stuff. A well, very interesting open problem. Now let's end with some uh, mathematics, however. So uh, well, we have all this integration, I mean, these guys are uh, manifolds are definitely Riemannian, right? That's a Riemannian manifold because, I mean, before knowing what's a differential manifold, the uh, Riemannian manifold is basically something that you can integrate upon. That's why they are good for. So we perfectly know how to integrate on our manifolds, and they are probably Riemannian, right? Uh, let's try to understand if they have some differential geometry structure. So, so for first problem is uh, to construct a Laplacian. And uh, well, I'll just talk about the sphere, then the things are a bit similar. So for the free sphere, uh, well, it's very simple, the Laplacian, the classical case, and the free case works the same, also have classical. So you just take products of coordinates of lengths r, and then you orthogonalize with respect to the integration. That's your Laplacian filtration, and it works. For instance, uh, yeah, that's an old remark I had in my paper with Goswami in uh, 2010, I think, or nine. So as a first thing, for instance, if you take the metric Q is a group with respect to this filtration, you get what you what you want, n plus. So it's definitely the Laplacian filtration. Now the problem is how to put eigenvalues on these spaces, and uh, yeah, there's uh, this is something very recent by Uwe Franz and the others. They're doing some whole lot of analysis on manifolds and probability, heat equations, things like that, Levy processes. And they got to a, recently to a proposal for diagonal values. I mean, there is some numbers there. And that remains all to be understood. I mean, it's, it's still a lot. So very interesting principles. So they have Laplacians on these things, very good. Now, if you want to derogate a lot of it's probably no, but that's for clear. So no one knows, yeah, no. But there's no, no proof of that. So uh, in the end, yeah, we're definitely reminding my how to integrate, we have a Laplacian, we're just missing this graph operator a la quan. So the problem is now uh, how to unify all this with quan. Well, all this, I mean, we haven't talked yet. There are many, many other manifolds. So we can, we can develop a whole menagerie there. Easy manifolds are free. So I mean, this is just the tip of the iceberg. It's uh, the UK six, right? You can further develop. So. All these geometries that we have, uh, can we unify them with one? And uh, in one sense, it's about understanding this, this business of France and all that going farther toward, uh, towards really having a very clear definition for the Laplacian, maybe something a bit uh, beyond that, towards the Iraq. And uh, in the other sense, now from Kwon also, uh, there's work to be done there because what we're doing here is Nash geometry, right? Everything is inside the sphere, it's algebraic, you have coordinates. So our problem is in what Kwon is doing, uh, which manifolds in the sense of Nash embeddings and which types of free spheres are twisted. So that's, uh, you see, in order to unify, I have to, to go in both senses. And uh, our uh, conjecture is that, well, there should be some kind of Nash geometry in the middle of finding the things. So this is it, and uh, well, I hope uh, you like it. So uh, it was a bit tough, probably, but uh, a lot of yeah, free probability Weinberg conformals are very important things. If you want to integrate, I think any Riemannian geometer uh, be be them classical or uh, free or non commutative want to integrate on their manifolds. These are the, the good techniques. Of course, there are many uh, some other of them. We'll uh, maybe talk about them. Uh, in the next lecture, uh, matrix models, there are some Cesar limiting theorems and uh, other, of course, integration of quantum like Dixmia traces. I mean, there are many things, but this is the, 
the core integration for Ingart. That's the, the future. Okay, so see you next time for a, for a lecture about, uh, it's gonna be algebraic again, but with a bit of worry too, about more manifolds. So we'll extend uh, the class that we have STUK to, to many, many other uh, homogeneous spaces and things like that. We'll also do some analysis of them. So, see you soon.